Good evening, race fans. Welcome to the Hoobazoo Radio Network and welcome to Drafting the Circuits. My name is Frank Santorowski. I'll be your host for the next hour as we go over this past week in racing. Joining me as always in the studio, Mr. Gray Warren, Mr. Seth Eggert, Mr. Richard Uden. Fellas, how we doing? Doing good. Doing great. All right, well, Busy, busy week in racing here as, you know, we're, we're approaching the end of the season. Um, rapidly among us, it's it's October. Uh, the weather's a little cooler. The the days are a little shorter. Uh, but we still got plenty of racing and plenty of racing news. So uh, let's just bang out the headlines real quick. Um, NASCAR was in Talladega. Um, it was a very interesting and wild race to watch. Uh, had a rain delay in there, so we were... Ran in two segments, one Sunday, one Monday. Uh, at the end of it all, it was Ryan Blaney taking the win. Um, Formula One, also affected by weather. They had their schedule shortened from a, a three-day event down to doing qualifying in the morning and a race in the afternoon. Uh, at the end of the day, well, at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, it was Valtteri Baltas uh, taking the win for Mercedes. Now, Richard, you obviously watched this race here. I, I, uh, I thought it, I thought it was a pretty good show. Um, yeah. Voucher got quite a start there when Vettel seemed to. I, it looked like he almost jumped the start and then hesitated so he wouldn't jump the start, and that yeah. moment of hesitation allowed Valtteri to just zoom around him, and, and then suddenly there was some talk that. Uh, we're going to have to penalize uh, Vettel for jumping the start. I'm like, that would just be a, a slap in the face. You know, you jumped the start and lost the lead. Now we're going to give you a penalty. But turns out they didn't They didn't put that penalty out. But uh, uh, there were some penalties for his teammates. So, Richard, I'll let you take over uh, from the um, pretty interesting start we had. And let's just uh, digest and go through some of the information from Suzuka. Yeah, well, I think it was for the third time in Suzuka the uh, qualifying was run on the Sunday morning before the race, and um, you know, you all I think through practice on Friday we'd seen resurgent uh, Mercedes team after the Ferrari's domination in the last few races, and uh, it wasn't to be in qualifying. Uh, he's come under criticism a little bit lately, but uh, you know, credit where credit's due to. Sebastian Vettel, he pulled that one heck of a lap on uh, Sunday morning, as it were, to uh, to claim pole for the for the race. That was uh, that was something special. That was um, that was the Sebastian of old there, uh, top top quality driving there, fantastic lap. Um, and then on a quick turnaround, I think it was three hours after qualifying finished, they were they were ready to go for the race and. Um, it was an interesting start. I don't really know what happened to Vettel. He just, whether he um, misjudged it, he was expecting this, the, the, the lights to go out and just reacted too quickly. Um, and, and the way it works is there's a, there's a line that the, the driver, the car has to be behind. And often what you'll find is the cars will back up six inches a foot short of that line. Just so that they make sure they get, they've got a decent amount of traction before their front tires hit that line. And that line is where the sensors are. So sometimes you can get away with this sort of like, has, you know, this sort of little jump. As long as you don't pass the line and as long as you stop again before the lights go out, then you can almost have a second start. And I think that's what happened with the tell. Um, the really unfortunate thing in the whole situation was not only did it um, scupper Sebastian's start, but it also had a detrimental impact on Charles Leclerc's start because he sort of reacted or didn't react or you know got confused by the situation. So 
it put both the Ferraris on the back foot and, and Valtteri was, you know, thank you very much. I'm going to take this spot and off he drives. Um, you then had, going into sort of turn one, turn two, you had uh, Charles Leclerc with uh, um, Max Verstappen on the outside and um, Leclerc just got a little bit ragged and uh, the car stepped out on him a little bit into turn two and he slid into sitting in the uh, side of Leclerc there, oh, sorry, into the side of Verstappen there, sustained a lot of damage on his car, and uh, the damage to Verstappen's car was ultimately uh, ultimately terminal, unfortunately. Uh, so, it, uh, you know, it was, it was a bit of a scrappy start, really. In the, in, back in the pack, there was some good racing, and uh, it settled into a pretty exciting race. Valtteri sort of, once he got that lead, you know, held it pretty dominantly, uh, and no, nobody could keep up with him, and nobody could catch him. So, yeah. Hamilton now let's, was, yeah, before we get too far off of the start there, yeah. so so we had Charles driving with a damaged wing, and yep. we all saw it was falling. It was like shedding little bits as it was driving on. And, yeah. and Ferrari waited a bit before they pulled him into the pits. And there's, well, um, I think there, there's, it, I think they, I think they called him in, but he's like, well, I can drive it. It's not that bad. Probably not realizing that there were bits dangling all over the track and. It was dangerous. Now, whether the black and orange flag, I think it is, for uh, a dangerous car was shown to him at any point during that time or not. I believe it was I, not shown because no, I, I, I don't I think just, it was. But yeah. obviously, the FIA will give team instructions and say, hey, guys, you need to bring him in. And he obviously didn't react to that or there was a miscommunication there. Um, I, uh, whichever way it turned out, yeah, he probably stood out a lap too long. And ironically, by the time he did pit, the, the bit that had fallen off, you know, the bit that was was causing the concern had already uh, decided to liberate itself and was uh, bouncing down the, uh, the the club start finish line, which is on top of the bridge. Um, took off uh, Lewis Hamilton's right uh, mirror. Charles Leclerc lost his left hand mirror, um, and yeah, it was, it was all a little bit scrappy there. Um, you, you've seen in the past, um, you know, when these uh, little aero flick ups on the end plates fall off. It, it's not actually that detrimental to the car. It's performance, really. It, it's mainly a balance thing, and typically the drivers can drive around it. Yeah, but like you, like you said, Char- yeah, yeah, yeah. Charles thought the car felt fine, but I mean, from his vantage point, uh, you know, yeah, you know you low down in the you know, cockpit with the, with it. Yeah, yeah, you can't you can't see that there. So he he probably didn't even realize that he was shedding debris. Um, exactly. But, but but then of course the big issue is he was had a brilliant drive through the field after changing the nose. I mean he was very exciting to watch over oh, the, yeah. over I mean, the course of the yeah, race. You know. Yeah, the, the, the class of the field probably in many ways that Ferrari car and uh, you know people criticize Suzuka as a circuit you can't necessarily overtake on. Well, I think you can. You know, I, I, and he certainly showed it anyway. It's um it's a great you know it's certainly doable around there and uh, in the end he was uh, moving through the pack I think he tried to go for the fastest lap at the end of the race there and they just couldn't quite get it done so with that with him missing out on the fastest lap that gave um, Mercedes the points they needed to clinch a sixth consecutive constructors championship and um, yeah congratulations to those guys it's um, so slightly interesting and it'd be interesting to get your guys opinions on this um you know, obviously, going back it's almost 10 years ago now, you know, when Red Bull started their dominating run of four championships in a row with Sebastian Vettel, you know, people were very vocal in criticising how boring the sport was and how you know, repetitive it was that Vettel was winning a week in, week out, and, and that nobody could get close to him. Now, I don't personally think that there's been the same... Uh, is backlash the right word? I don't know. Criticism, maybe, of Mercedes for the way they've been dominating over the last six years. Whether it's the way they handle it from a PR perspective, I don't know. What I, I, find, I, I do hear some backlash on Mercedes, yeah. But not as yeah, much but, maybe as Red Bull. Yeah, but, 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 you know, when Ferrari had a run of six in a row, six constructors in a row and during the Schumacher yeah. era, there, there was not a lot of backlash there at all because, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, when it comes to the, the bulk of the European fan base, there are a ton of Ferrari fans. Okay. Of course. No, of course. And also, I think, you know, not wanting to try and diverse too much, I think what you saw with the Ferrari domination was far more 
it was different to what Mercedes and Red Bull have done. Um, I have an issue with the way that Mercedes approach it at times. I think they come across rightly or wrongly slightly arrogant with the whole. Oh, we, you know, they're five races from the end of the season and need ten points to win the championship, and they're still. Oh well, we've got to make sure we get all these. But you know, it's like, come on, guys, you're taking the piss a little bit here, aren't you? You know, you've got this in the bag. Don't try and. You know, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's just me, but I think there's something that just doesn't quite sit right with the way Toto comes across in that sort of situation. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, at, at the end of the day, I I don't think that having a you know, a championship decided with so many races left is necessarily healthy for the sport. You know, you know, we all like to see a, a championship battle go all the way down to the last race because, I mean, in the end, if, if everything is settled, and, and we've seen it in Formula One numerous times where there's, you know, one or two or three races left and, and everything is settled. And so those last three rounds might as well be an exhibition race, but we've seen, and you know, so we've be, got yeah. – what five five full races left, and the constructors are settled, and the drivers yeah. might as well be settled because you figure for Valtteri to uh, win this thing, he has to outscore Lewis by I believe the stat I read was sixteen points per race. Yeah, I mean that ain't gonna is, happen. That ain't gonna happen. Yeah, so. But I, I wonder if in 10, 20, 30 years time, we're gonna look back at this period of Hamilton's domination. In the same way that we did Schumacher and Ferrari's domination, you know, 15 years ago, um, I, I and there's no doubt that um, you know Hamilton is a you know the driver of his generation and arguably in the, one of the greatest of all time. But I just think there's something is there something missing? I don't know what the word is. There's, they haven't had the dominance in some ways that Ferrari had, even though statistically they have. There's just, to my mind, there's something different between what you see today with uh, Mercedes and what we saw with Ferrari all those years, all those years ago. Hmm. Interesting, interesting to, to ponder. Yeah, because there's, yeah. as I try to break it down, it's at the end of the day, if you look at the stats, it's very similar. And I mean, to your point, how will this be viewed in another 10 years or another 20 years? I think right now, Hamilton doesn't get his just do from a lot of the fans because they're saying, well, he's in the best car. Uh, most of your Formula One champions have been in the best car. I can't uh, think of <laughs> one that hasn't. I mean, I would go, the, only, the most recent one I can think of is maybe Schumacher back in the mid-90s when he was in Be- with Benetton because that Benetton certainly wasn't, well... He wasn't a class of the field, yeah. 95 especially. 95. Uh, 82... Keke Rosberg was not in the best car. No, but, he but, got but, 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 Well, his his... The guys in the best cars um, neither finished the season. I mean, Villeneuve perished, no. and uh, um, Peroni uh, was injured badly enough that he that he missed the rest yeah. of the season. But that that particular season, 1982, was all the cars were so evenly matched. I, mean, I believe we had a uh, was it 11 different winners that year. It was pretty high, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, it was the record for the most, and that was um, so nobody really dominated there. Um, but you know, Williams was a top team at the time so oh yeah but but i wouldn't say kk had the best car no but otherwise most of your most of the formula one champions were in the best car yeah best one or two anyway certainly in that certainly um, yeah yeah we've had some great close battles between teams i mean when you consider mclaren versus ferrari and and um you know lotus and ferrari over the years uh, williams and brabham great yeah. battles there yeah yeah all right, well let's get let's get back to the rest of this this race here before we before we go off on a history lesson. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, let's uh, let's try to pick up where we left. Charles has all the damage uh, and yeah. goes in and then penalized after the fact. Yeah, they said that they wanted to get both drivers input before they made a call on it. Um, and then Charles very openly turned around post race and said, "Yeah, my fault." Which I thought was very magnanimous. I mean, but personally, I, I I was surprised he got a penalty. I mean, it was hard racing. It was close racing. He didn't deliberately drive into Verstappen. He ran wide, you know, uh, and, and pushed him off the track. It wasn't like he went wide to force him off the track. From looking at the the um, camera angle, it was pretty clear that he just the back end got loose and he slid out. So. Um, 
Yeah, a little bit surprised that um, he got that penalty personally, but I mean, I, I don't think you're going to see too many people complain about that one. Vettel was second, Hamilton third on the day. Yes. Leclerc was, I believe Leclerc crossed the line fourth, sixth. but was yeah, sixth. I think he finished sixth and was classified seventh eventually. After after the penalty. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah. Yeah, I don't think he's going to, I mean, he, you know, it, he's got to the stage of his career now where unless he's winning, he's not bothered. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. He, and he's earned that right as well. He's earned that right to have that, um, you know, mentality and you can't begrudge the kid. I mean, he's been, I think, you know, from my mind, he's been the driver of the season. Um, I think what he's come along and pushed his, you know, four-time world champion teammate has been, you know, very impressive. And the way he's gone up against Hamilton and, and dominated in some of the races, even the ones he didn't win, the ones he should have won, were, um, yeah, you know, the kid deserves a lot of credit for that. Certainly, yeah. So, what's the environment like at Ferrari? We keep hearing that it might be a little toxic with who's number yeah. one and who's number two, because or that that's just what pundits like to say to create some news. Um, personally, I, mean, I don't think I'd, I'd, I'd be very surprised if there is. I mean, obviously, in any team sport, especially Formula One, because the car is the dominant feature within the series. You know, you've got to beat your teammate. So that's your first benchmark. If you can go, if you can't beat your teammate. You you know you're in the wrong sport basically, um, but you know I, I I think there's two guys there who are extremely talented. Um, you could argue that that is probably the strongest lineup of teammates on the grid. Um, you know you look at it and yeah, say, it, it'd be hard to disagree with that. I yeah, agree. Yep. I, I think. And I think Leclerc's really stepped up and, you know, taken to that role incredibly well. And, yeah, of course, Patel's going to be a little bit like, I don't know, where did this guy come from? You know, his nose is going to be put out of place a little bit. But, I mean, it's, hey, it's part and parcel of the job, buddy. So, um, you know, it's always going to happen. It'll be interesting to see how Patel reacts to it going forward, because obviously, you know, you look back not too far in history where he was with Red Bull and uh, Danny Ricciardo came along. And, um, you know, beat him pretty much. I think it was in 2009, was it? No, um, 2015. Uh, First year of the Turbos, anyway. First Something year like when, that. When Vettel didn't win the championship, you know, he as soon as it was done, he jumped ship and was off to Ferrari. And that was a, you know, that was almost like, uh, well, I'm not winning now, so I'm going to leave. Um, so it was a strange mentality. Well, it's a strange mentality. You know, that Red Bull team had been, you know, built around him. It was obviously that when um, Mark Webber was there, Vettel was the favourite, and for him to, you know, Ricardo come along and, and, and push Vettel, it, it sort of um, made him react to that situation. So it'll be interesting to see how he reacts to the um, Charles Leclerc situation, whether he will look to move on again in the future or he'll fight back and really up his game. Um, you know, that... Um, the win in Singapore certainly helped his case, and the, I think the pole lap, as I said earlier, that he did at Suzuka was probably his best qualifying performance that I can remember in a long time. Um, I, th- I think that was a really, really good lap, and um, you know, you, you saw him on the radio after the uh, qualifying, and he, he said, "Yeah, that, that was a good one." <laughs> you know, when when drivers say, "Yeah, that was good," then you know it's good. You know it's good, yeah, because drivers are rarely satisfied. They always think they, they could have got a little more. So um, yeah. let's look down the grid a little bit. I thought we saw some pretty brilliant drives from a couple other guys in the field. Um, yeah, I, I think the the um, and the McLaren team seems to be looking better and better. Um, oh yeah, and a little more solid. But but now they're moving on from uh, Renault over to uh, Mercedes mm-hmm. for for next year. So after they had moved on from Honda. Um, I don't think it's, is it not next year? Is it? It's the year after. I think. The, I, yeah, I believe, I believe it's the year after. Yeah, so yeah, 2021. Yeah, um, I, which I somehow I can't see that be the best move. I, I McLaren seems to uh, you know shoot themselves in the foot lately, but uh, I mean maybe that is the move. But like you know, to your point, we had discussed this um, earlier uh, that uh, you're never going to be you're never going to get the same equipment that the Mercedes team is getting. No, you know so, um, and I think Renault is is giving them a pretty good product, pretty close to what they had because Renault's chassis is not up to par with um, 
you know, with what McLaren has put together right now. No, um, and McLaren yeah. have got to take a lot of credit for that. You know, they, they, certainly, yeah. um, certainly gone out there and they've certainly performed and it's been, um, you know, reasonably impressive. Um, the, certainly the, the, the latter half of the year where they've, um, started to, um, you know, they've started to sort of get ahead in that second pack, if you like, that second uh, championship. The, the B uh, series the B or the, or the yeah. tier tier two. Uh, yeah, there's a, a number uh, of ways you could put it. Yeah, the, be, the best know, of the uh, rest. Yeah, and, you know, we were obviously mentioning Charles Leclerc as, as driver of the year. Uh, I think Lando Norris has got to take a huge amount of credit as well because, you know, I've been very, very impressed. With, I've been very impressed with all the rookies uh, that have come through. You know, Albon, um, Russell, uh, and um, uh, Norris. You know, I think all three of those guys that have come through have been have driven exceptionally well, and have really sort of gone up against their more experienced teammates and given them a good, good challenge. Um, and I think you look at Lando Norris, and he's very. You know, you see the little videos that F1 put out on Facebook and the like, and he's a very jovial guy. You know, he gets on well with people. He gets on well with the other drivers. He has a laugh and a joke with them. And, you know, obviously he had a bit of a coming together with um, Albon uh, in Suzuka going to the final chicane earlier in the race. And, and post-race, they were laughing and joking about it. You know, Lando Norris was like, hey, dude, you know, I was about to pit. You know, so you really screwed me. Not only did I... You know, I get pushed off and lost the place and had damaged the car. But then I had to do another lap before I could pit and all this. And, but there was no animosity. There was no finger pointing and, you know, anything like that. I mean, good grief. If that was NASCAR, they'd be, you know, calling each other out in the, you know, the uh, trailer park after the race. Uh, but yeah, I, think, I, know, I think I think Formula One needs more of that. That's what I like about the, the rookies this year. Uh, you've got Formula One has this long history of these guys with these Iceman personalities. Yeah, you know, and I, I think it all started kind of with Schumacher. But you've got uh, you know Kimmy, who's about as dry as uh, unbuttered he's white toast. Great, though, isn't he? You know, he is great. That, yeah, but he's but, he, but he's so he's so. It. Yeah, but I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's great to see these guys smile, laugh, have a uh, have a little little bit of emotion, and, and even even Lewis with his some of his rumblings on social media and hanging yeah. out hanging out with rappers and whatnot. I think it's all it's all good for the sport to, to see these guys smiling, and having fun, and, and not you know. I, and I think Liberty has a little bit to do with that because for a while the the, the Formula One drivers were just absolutely inaccessible. Yeah, you know, and and that was. That's for you know for us as Americans anyway. We we like to we like drivers with personality. We like to get to know who the drivers are. So I want to I want to say that's a little bit of Liberty's influence in there, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, And I think it's good. I think the drivers like it in a way. I think they can open up. They can, um, you know, I I think they like that mentality and that um, openness because again, it gives it shows them a different dimension now. Some of them, it's just not in their nature, as you say. Kimmy, Valtteri, they're, they're, you know, not massively interactive people. But then, you know, you, the, you see the the guys like Danny Ricciardo, Lando Norris, um, you know, some of those guys. Um, they, you know, they enjoy what they do, and and you see that on a on a weekly basis in the in the interviews and you know the the way they interact on this on this um, at the track and. You know, there's some videos going around of um, Lando Norris and Daniel Ricciardo at, um, you know, in the press conferences and, you know, trying to make each other laugh and all this sort of stuff of uh, Lando Norris's inability to grow facial hair and all this sort of stuff. And it's brilliant. It's so good. And it, as you say, it's, yeah, it, it gives the sport that other dimension. And uh, even some of the older guys, you know, I think uh, Sebastian Vettel's sort of come out of his shell a little bit and Lewis is maybe the same. And, and maybe that's, Liberty's influence, but also maybe it's just their maturity as they as they're maturing in their own right and they're growing up and they're um, you know realizing maybe that they don't have to play this sort of straight uh, straight faced um, mentality all the time. Yeah, I mean we've we haven't seen really great personalities in Formula One since like the days of James Hunt. You know, we've, we've oh, never, yeah. we I haven't seen a guy, we haven't seen a guy that. like that. Yeah. So. No, I don't think, in all fairness, unfortunately, you're ever going to see anybody in that sort of ilk uh, again. 
but it's certainly um you know you, you want to see this little bit of a more open and um, diverse personality for sure certainly so let's talk about this um protest from racing point about the legality of the renault cars now now i know now yeah, s- s- I, I know you said you didn't read up on it a lot seth you read uh, you read up on it some uh, what I've read up on it is it's similar to something that happened, I believe, in the 1980s, uh, and Renault could be in danger of having all of their points uh, up to this point, essentially, uh, excluded or disqualified, essentially. So what, yeah, I mean, I know yeah, what's, what, what's, the, the, um, what's the nature it, of the... It has to do with the brake bias system. That's right. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, something about it being dependent on race conditions and or uh, it's a certain measuring. Yeah. Got yeah. Measuring in there. Yeah. There's something about that. I mean, I think I mean, basically what's happened here is somebody's left Renault, gone to Racing Point and said, hey, guys, look at this. Yeah. You know, uh, it happens all the time. It's just this one's been quite public. It happened with BAR in the mid nineties or mid two thousands when they had that uh, fuel tank issue at uh, Imola. You know, it was a, a disgruntled employee left, and I think it was Renault where they went. They went to Renault, and uh, at the next possible race, they got on the phone to the FIA and said, "Hey, you know, check out uh, BAR's uh, fuel tank," and they did, and they got. Found out with a regular fuel tank and got banned for two races. Um, my, without knowing the exact rules that they're supposed to have broken, um, it could well be a don't bring this back to the car scenario. Or it could be a, you know, a disqualification. Uh, it depends a lot on what the intent was. Uh, and if it was a clear, we are going out to do something to break the rules to get, you know, an unfair advantage. Um, now, this wouldn't be the first time Renault or the Renault team in that guys have done something along those lines. Of course, back in the um, mid 90s, I think it was 94, when uh, Schumacher won his first world championship, there was a lot of discussion over the legality of that Benetton with, um, you know, extra modes available on the steering wheel if you went through a, a special, you know, it's almost like a PlayStation game, you know, up, down, left, left, right, right sort of thing would enable traction control. Um, their claim at the time was that, you know, we, they didn't have the opportunity to rewrite the whole software and couldn't remove the traction control because it was an integral part of the software. And so they put this really complicated combination in which the driver just so happened to find out about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's fine. I, I, I remember right. Schumacher's first yeah. chance. It seemed like they tried every way to make sure that he wouldn't win it, and he still did. He oh, yeah. still did. Yeah, yeah, I, I, think, I think he ended up sitting out a race or two, I believe. Yeah, he missed two because at Silverstone, he, he overtook on the parade lap at Silverstone and got to his grid slot first. So they black flagged him, so they disqualified him from the race, but he ignored the black flag, finished the race, and then was disqualified post-race. And then on top of that, he had a two-race suspension. I think he missed, like, Portugal and mm, Monza that year, I'm going to say. Uh, yeah, still won the championship. Still won the championship, <laughs> yep, yep. So here we are back to history lessons. So so let's talk, Sorry, about, yeah. let's, let's talk about the future then, because it was announced earlier today um, that the rumored Miami Formula One race, now they have a, uh, what's the verbiage, an agreement in principle uh, to host a race around the, um, Hard Rock Stadium there, which is where the uh, Miami Dolphins play football. Um, so this will be... Uh, they the really play football. It's, well, I've been playing football Whoa, okay. <laughs> where the Miami Dolphins show up every Sunday. <laughs> oh, Richard. Sorry. Um, my personal opinion now. Now the city has yet, the, show this week. Multi sport show. Yep. The, yeah, the city. The, the city <laughs> has yet to show up or has yet to vote on this. Um, that vote's going to be on October 28th, and I, my personal feeling is that they're going to have a hard time getting this off the ground uh, because historically, in recent history, getting a street race approved in a major metro, you know, metropolis area 
has been just a jungle of red tape and uh, CF paperwork and so many roadblocks. Because we've seen uh, the proposed Grand Prix of New Jersey fail for Formula One. We've seen the proposed uh, IndyCar race in Boston fail. So this one, I just have to take a believe it when I see it kind, I, I, kind I of attitude towards this one. I think the advantage they've got here is that the land is all owned by the owner of the Miami Dolphins. They're not using any public land or public road. Oh, I think there's maybe one public road. Yeah, I, was, they, I thought there was at least one public street on there, yeah. I and, think there is one public, but the vast majority of the land, so where all the infrastructure would be built, so for the garages, the grandstands, the pit complexes, all that sort of stuff, would be on um, private land. Which so, is why they abandoned the downtown race to begin with to go with this yeah. plan. So I, I hope they get it off the ground. I mean, I, I fully believe that uh, the U.S. can support a second Grand Prix. I mean, my gosh, we did for years and years. I, I mean, think the, uh, it, the, we had the, the we pro- had three at once for a while in the in the early yeah. 80s. The, the PR was a little bit mislaid in that they were sort of, but you know, they said, oh, you know, we want to, you know, we want to have the, the great races in Formula One of Monaco and. Singapore and Barcelona and Miami. It's like, yeah, you probably didn't really want to include Barcelona in that, did you? It's not really a classic race. Well, it is is what it is. I mean, you know, you're (laughs) probably some intern writing the press release, but uh, I'd like to see them get it off the ground, but I'm just a little skeptical because I've seen too many of these things fail or too many of these things be a a one and done. Uh, If you recall, the 1984 Dallas Grand Prix was... Uh, kind of set up in the same way. It was on all yeah, private yeah, private I land. Think, it was. I think a, we've got to be careful of is, you know, it's another, you know, it's this old parking lot truck, isn't it? Like they had out in, was it in Vegas? Was a parking lot? Vegas was yeah. Caesar's Palace um, Grand Prix was a, a parking lot. The yeah, the, the um, Dallas race was a parking lot. IndyCar held a, a parking lot race in the Meadowlands uh, back in the eighties. So I mean, the the track layout. Looks pretty looks deep. Pretty looks pretty yeah. decent. Yeah, yeah, but that's yeah. on paper until we get a car on there and drive it through. Uh, you know, it, on, it honestly, it, it's pretty tight. Big, it'd be another one of these big, vast tilka domes with, you know, acres of red, white, and blue runoff astroturf and all that sort of, you know, the high friction compound surface and all this sort of bullshit. You know, we need, you know, you, you need a gravel trap and a tire barrier and grass and yeah, you know that's my frustration with it. You know, go to build a track that's suited for it. Don't uh, don't come up with these um, you know urban jungles of concrete and what have you. It, it so, would not so. hurt my feelings to see Formula One return to Watkins Glen. You know, exactly. Or Proper. or or to Indianapolis. I mean, that was <laughs> you've yeah. got a purpose-built racing facility there. It's I mean, the, the road course was was good there, but you've got a you know a built-in fan base there. Unfortunately, the whole Michigan debacle uh, combined with uh, Ecclestone, yeah, wasn't it? have kind of have kind of wrecked it there. But I, I thought they had yeah. they had a pretty good deal there in Indianapolis, a turnkey operation there. But I mean, we'll we'll have to see how this Miami thing works out. I mean, obviously for some reason that South Florida is a market that Liberty really wants to break into. Uh, so we'll just see what happens. Yep. 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 All right. So where are we next in Formula One? We have uh, Mexico. So slightly different. I think different schedule this year. It's Mexico then Austin rather than Austin Mexico as it was last year. I think. It is Mexico then Austin, and Mexico yeah. is in two weeks, same day as uh, Martinsville in two weeks. That's it. Yeah. 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 That's it. Okay. So. So we'll be in Mexico in a couple of weeks. Uh, any parting thoughts on Formula One? Anything we forgot to mention before we start talking about the Talladega race? Not that I can think of. All right, Gray, Seth, Talladega, wild show. Um, Joey Logano showed me that the, the, the biggest pieces of duct tape I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, whoever wants to jump in and take us through the race, I, I thought it was a barn burner. I thought it was a pretty darn exciting show it was a wild race uh ryan blaney ended up just barely edging out ryan newman by seven thousandths of a second uh blaney basically was in a must win situation uh the race it was a typical talladega race you had a lot of action uh there were three separate big accidents uh the major story or 
controversy, if you want to call it that, was the supposed manufacturer team orders, especially with Chevrolet. They had a meeting before the race and during the rain delay uh, that saying that Chevy drivers must work with Chevy drivers or else. Uh, not sure exactly what that or else meant. But in the end, all the Chevy drivers that were working together got wiped out in the first two big ones. So I'm not entirely sure how well that plan worked out. Uh, well, they were all wreck- sticking. They were all sticking together. So when the wreck happened, they were all right there. <laughs> yes, yes. In in theory, that works out fine if you can get lined up together. But what happens invariably is the is the field gets split up after pit stops, and you've got you can't you know it's uh, if you can get hooked back up, you know when you got cars running three and four abreast that's fine but you got other guys trying to trying to break it up and you know it's, especially uh, especially the toyotas and denny hamlin in particular uh since they have the fewest cars on track mm-hmm. uh, i believe this past weekend they had six if you count Klingerman and seven if you count the car long car which is right neither here nor there but that being said uh they had so few cars compared to Ford and Chevy. They were essentially just trying to break up and sneak in between the and other work, manufacturers. Yeah, and work with whatever car they felt they worked the best with. So yeah, so that's all fine and good. That strategy, you know, you can you can line up and come down pit road together the first couple of times maybe, but uh, you know, Late in the race, when the field gets jumbled, and you, 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 it's, it's damn near impossible. I mean, two guys can work together if they're in position to, and I understand what they're trying to do, but it kind of backfired on them. And, and uh, the, the two strongest cars there were, were the 17 and the 22. They seemed to be able to go, and, and the 12 was pretty good as well. I think the 12 ended up leading a lot of laps, but the uh, the the 17 and the 22 could could seem to go to the front at will that when they wanted to, they could manipulate, uh, manipulate the draft and, and were strong enough to, uh, to, to get to the front and, and hold some of the other cars off. So it would have been, it would have been, uh, kind of interesting to see what would have happened had, uh, had we hadn't, you know, uh, had those big wrecks, uh, take out so many, so many, uh, so many good cars, but, uh, you're right. It was, it was a fantastic race. Um, a lot, a lot of racing uh, throughout the pack. They didn't, uh, they weren't uh, uh, complacent. They didn't line up and 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 follow nose to tail. They raced from the from the from the green flag uh, on Sunday, and then on the restart on Monday, they raced raced all through the field and uh, the guys going back and forth to the front. So. Uh, yeah, I thought it. I thought it was a great race, and and, and it was kind of wild. And I think part of the the, the stuff that made it kind of wild is, uh, you know, the pressure on the uh, playoff guys trying to uh, trying to get up front and uh, and stay there, and and you know wanting to race some. So uh, yeah, uh, a good race at Talladega for sure. Let's. Uh, do, let's- Oh, go ahead, Seth. Speaking of the playoff guys, uh, one that I want, or two that I want to point to, uh, Logano and Chase Elliott. Uh, Chase Elliott was in the first big one, and he got punted in the right rear. It knocked uh, his car out of alignment, and he was crabbing the rest of the race. Uh, I'm honestly surprised he was able to finish, let alone finish inside the top ten. That may have given him a chance to be able to make it at, in Kansas next week. Uh, and then you have Logano, who, like uh, Frank alluded to, had the biggest pieces of duct tape we've seen. On yeah. The, uh, the, uh, track, uh, the tire, after it shredded uh, with the contact with William Byron, broke through the left rear crush panel and was shredding the foam on the inside of the car. Yeah, that was a, that was a really wild in-car camera shot because it looked like Joey was inside a popcorn popper. Yeah, uh, you could see all, that, all that foam blowing around. Or snow, yeah. or snow globe. Uh, yeah. Right, that right. Being, that being said, it's my understanding. I'm not entirely sure what the exact wording of the rule is, but it's my understanding that that foam is required, but it also cannot be added. 
So with the foam being shredded. Well, it, I, it, it I, didn't I, shred the whole piece out of it. It probably got some of the stuff on the but, on the peripheral end of it, and it blows it around. But the thing is, NASCAR officials didn't even get a chance to look because they were already slapping tape on it before yeah. they could even look. Yeah. Well, so I, mean, I don't know if they got away with a fast one over NASCAR or not. Uh, it meant the difference by 21 positions uh, versus where Brad Keselowski and others were in the same wreck or similar wrecks. So that might have saved Logano's season as well. I don't think they would have touched anything. It, I, I think it probably busted up a little bit of the foam in it and, and – and broke it up. That stuff's pretty, pretty hard stuff, and it will, it will crumble and and, and come off. But uh, by and large, it's going the bigger, the bigger pieces were were alongside the uh, the driver's door. Um, MRN was describing uh, Logano's car on uh, on the radio as looking like a, a baked potato because they had wrapped it in that aluminum foil <laughs> uh, tape. Uh, that's what they, one of the guys on pit road said after they made repairs and he came back down. They used this uh, this aluminum foil looking tape over the over the uh, left rear quarter panel. He said it looked like a baked potato wrapped up. So. Yeah, and, and the entire hood too, because yeah. poor old Joey driving to the pits with the hood sticking straight up in the air. I mean, thankfully there was that little hole there where the flap goes that he was able to look through. But this brings up a, a question that I have for you guys. NASCAR is one of the few racing series where they will repair some damage and, and put a guy back out there on the track. Uh, you know, the Indy cars and Formula 1 are a, a bit more fragile, and, and when they get into major damage, it's generally not repairable. Uh, NASCAR, we, we've seen time and time again, you know, the 200-mile-an-hour tape, tape it up, get it back on the track. Is there a point where... Safety is perhaps compromised, and this I bring this up, Seth, because you said about maybe some of the energy absorbing foam missing out of well, the door. Uh, is there is there are there any rules in place for that? There, how yeah. badly damaged? I mean, other than yeah, the, the damage well, clock. That's what the uh, damage. That's what the five, clock the five minute clock is for. Minutes. If you can't, you know, five or six, whatever the clock is. If you can't repair it in that time, you have to retire the car. Right, if but you, but what it, what constitutes a repair? I mean, is yeah. I, it, speak, what constitutes sorry. a repair is if, if if you return to the track, you have to maintain minimum speed. If you can't maintain minimum speed, then you then you have to retire the car. So therefore, you can you you have to make significant enough repair so that the car can return to the track and make minimum speed. But from a safety okay. from a safety aspect, right? That that is the safety aspect. Okay, so if they if they can maintain minimum speed, if they can maintain yeah. minimum speed, that means the driver can control the car, and it drives to where he can maintain minimum speed. Then they can stay on the track, and that 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 kind of is is kind of the safety issue wrapped up in the whole thing. If they if they can't repair the car in the in, in the six minute time. Then, then they retire. Oh. If they do repair the car or makes makes repairs within that six minute time frame and return to the track, then they have to maintain minimum speed. For example, uh, Daniel Suarez was in one of those big ones, and they made repairs. He went on track trying to maintain minimum speed and maintain control. As soon as he got to turn three, the car looped around on him, and he was sent to the garage by NASCAR. Yeah, that was right. it. Yeah. Okay. You, I, also, you, you also, if you drop the window net, you have or, to retire. Or yeah. if uh, you're hooked up to a uh, tow truck and they raise, you're hooked up the raising the hood. Raising the hood. If the hood is raised and you hook to the, hooked up to the thing. Now, there is a rule, and, and this came into play when, when uh, uh, Boyer high, spun and high-centered on the corner where the rear wheels were off the ground and he couldn't get it, was having to try to rock it back and forth to get it done. Had the tow truck come up and raised the hood and hooked the car up to it, he would have been disqualified. Well, he would have had to retire the car. There is a, there is a rule that you can make a, a loop 
to the rear bar that goes around and protects the fuel cell area. And you can put a loop on that. And if the car is towed from the rear and they use that loop by raising the deck lid, then the car, then that is that, that they won't retire the car. But that's uh, that that's just another little nuance in the rule. But yeah, th th they build in the safety thing thing from that. Um, thereby, you know. But the the biggest thing that was happening years ago, there were guys were coming in pit road and they they'd make all these repairs, and the repairs weren't done in in a manner uh, that would allow the car when wouldn't allow the car to go back out on track and not shed parts, you know, and that. That was a safety issue. Now you cannot add parts to the car. You can't cut them off and put it like we used to have, uh, you know, uh, Kevlar fenders, uh, Kevlar nose pieces that we could actually pop rivet or tape in the place to replace those damaged. Those are no longer allowed. You can remove pieces. You can remove fenders. You can remove part of the nose. Uh, you can even remove the hood and go back out. But once you do that, you have to be able to maintain minimum speed in the car. And if you can't, you have to retire. All right. Thanks for explaining that. Um, now we have Seth, you've got some breaking news you just heard. Yes. Uh, College Racing, who fields the number 10 and number 11 Xfinity cars, uh, they're uh, number 10 hauler on the way to Kansas Speedway overturned on Interstate 40. Uh, hmm. Both both oh, drivers oh are both drivers uh, are okay per a college statement. Although the Fox affiliate here is reporting that at least one of them was injured. Uh, I sent a photo in our group chat. Uh, it rolled down an embankment, and from what you could barely take uh, make out, the backup car is sticking through the front of the hauler. Ouch. Just in a photo. I didn't get the photo. It's in the group chat. I'm looking. Okay, well, our listeners group. won't see our group chats. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, I know. I'm just, just, it, I'm to it didn't come it. up on mine. Where did it happen it's, at? What state? Uh, North Carolina, Western North Carolina. No, oh, well, good, goodness gracious. If it, went, if, it, if it was going through Hayward County, I drove through there on Monday going to Knoxville. Uh, that that would have been uh, that I had I had to dodge a wreck up there too. There was a there was a upside down tractor trailer along I forty in Hayward County on uh, on Monday. That's that's pretty tough. Yeah, I hate that for the guys. And say it was the ten hauler. Number ten Xfinity series call it. Yeah, that's their that's their part time car. That's yeah, it's, not, uh, that's uh, a full time car. And they say they still plan on fielding two cars this weekend. Okay. Probably use the backup for the use the backup for the for the primary. Yeah. 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 Well, hopefully, mm -hmm. hopefully everybody's okay. I, I mean, obviously our thoughts are for the the, the truck driver who may be injured. Uh, but uh, for again, some that, reason that that's breaking news that it, just happened as we're speaking yeah. on the air. So, so for some, some reason, reason it'll be two days old. For some reason that picture. Well, that's come true. On the group chat. Well. All right. Well, let's. Uh, we we also had a truck series race at Talladega. Yes, we uh, did. Let's, yeah, let's run through that quickly. Which ended in controversial fashion yeah. as Johnny Sauter forced Riley Hertz below the W.O. line coming to the finish. Sauter took the checkered flag first, celebrated, was given the checkered flag, and then NASCAR elected to enforce the other half of the W.O. line penalty, which is if you force the driver below you will re be sent to the tail end of the lead lap. Therefore, Spencer Boyd and Young Motorsports earned their first career win. And where does this put um, Sauter in the, the standings? I know where he uh, is. Sauter out. was eliminated. Yeah, he was already uh, out, right? Eight. Yeah, okay. Yes. But Spencer Boyd, who is running part-time this year... Uh, this is his first Truck Series win. He only led one lap at uh, Talladega. It's just his second top five finish. And aside from a handful of late model races, uh, this is essentially his biggest win since 
the summer shootout series at Charlotte Motor Speedway in 2012 in a legend car. <laughs> well, good for him. Good for yeah. him. So we're off to Kansas next. Correct. Do, do we have – did you say there's a week off in between? No, Kansas is coming no. up this week as these guys it's are on Kansas the way to Kansas. Weekend. So elimination round. Who Who is in trouble? Uh, Chase Elliott, William Byron, uh, Clint Boyer, and Eric um, – Alex Bowman. Bowman. God, could, it could be absolutely catastrophic weekend for Hendrick, couldn't it? It could be. It could Certainly be. could, yeah, but you've also talked to guys that have the ability to really run well, especially Chase, uh, Chase Elliott. Yeah, this, uh, Chase is the defending winner of this race, and all of the Hendrick cars back in the spring at Kansas – this was arguably one of their best races of the year. Yeah, I think uh, I think Bowman and, and Chase Elliott will, and, and will, well, will run well there, no, no doubt about it. Well, the thing is, they're all about 18 to 20 points back. Granted, all that can be made up in one to two stages. That being said, if that is made up in one to two stages and say – Bowman bumps out Logano, and Chase Elliott wins. We could see Joey Logano, the defending champion, be knocked out in the second round of the playoffs. It could happen. It could happen. And the other driver who is close to the same position as Logano is Brad Keselowski. Uh, of the of the drivers, the only ones that are locked in. Via wins, Blaney and Larson. Via points, Denny Hamlin. Okay, so there's essentially five spots up for, for grabs, is that right? Yes. Five okay. spots up for grabs between eight drivers. Or, sorry, uh, nine drivers. All right, so it'll be so Kansas will be a very important round for a lot of these guys that would uh, want to advance on. But uh, you know, good job to Ryan Ryan Blaney. Um, this guy needed a win, um, and Kyle Larson had who had won the previous week there. He's so these guys are locked in, and Denny's locked in. I, I still, I've been saying this for a while. I still think Denny is strong for the championship because it seems like his teammate Kyle Busch has kind of fallen off the map. And when I say fallen off the map, I don't mean he's disappeared, but he's not the same Kyle Busch who's in contention for the win week after week after week. Like I said last week, Kyle essentially, it almost like he falls off a cliff once it gets to the summer. At it, Year in, year out, his stats just show that once it gets to about July, August, he just doesn't win again. The only time he's won in the playoffs is 2015. When he when he had 11 weeks off in the early part of the season. Due to so, injury, yes. Right, right. So let's let's move on from NASCAR because we've got about eight minutes left in the show. I want to cover a couple of other topics. Uh, well, first one is a NASCAR one. Uh, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. announced his plans for next year. Um, Gray, you want to tell us what that is or Seth? He will, Go be going, he will be going to JTG Doherty Racing, uh, replacing Chris Busher, who ironically is replacing Stenhouse at Roush Fenway. Uh, number is t- to be announced. Uh, they are not sure if they're going to keep it the number 37 or change it to a different number. Uh, another number that is historic for that team, at least in the Xfinity series, is the number 59. Uh, back when they had the number 59 Kingsford car uh, for years and years. Uh, Sponsors also, interestingly, TBA. Uh, There's a possibility that Stenhouse might be bringing a sponsor from Roush with him, although there's nothing to confirm on that front. Uh, It's also interesting that both of JTG Doherty drivers are – Managed by KHI Kevin Harvick Incorporated. So we essentially had a driver swap here. Both guys are going to be in a car next year. So good for them. I mean, I I, I like both Busher and uh, Stenhouse pretty well. I mean, they're they're, they're great mid pack guys who occasionally challenge for the win. So now Richard Toro Rosso is changing their name. Yes. 
that's another odd story out there because they've they've changed their names a, f- a few times over the years. But the, the new name is oh, got to, don't put me on the phone. It's that oh, it's a, it's a, Alpha Alpha, Alpha something Alpha Tori. Alpha Tori, yeah, that's Alpha a star Tori, yeah. isn't it? Or a galaxy? I don't know. Well, um, it's, but, it's just going to cause the uh, commentators to to get it wrong, just like they still call the uh, the racing point cars Force India every now and again. So. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, um, it's it's better than racing point, isn't it? I think. At least there's some uh, meaning I mean, behind it. It's it's I mean you got two alphas in there, so you get Alpha Romeo and Alpha Torre. We just need an Alpha Centuri to <laughs> round it out, get all the alphas in there. <laughs> Maybe get another team called Alpha Male, I don't know. So Alpha Prime. Alpha Prime, there you go, there you go. <laughs> uh, oh boy. Now, now the the IndyCar series had their next test of the aero screen. They had it at Richmond, and they will be adding Richmond to their schedule next year. So it was the, there was for for the, the the guys testing were Dixon and Newgarden. The, they added a little tweak to the aero screen, uh, which was some air inlets to make it a little more comfortable for the driver. Um, again, positive feedback from both drivers. Uh, they also uh, put a little little paint over the top of it or a little wrap over the top of the thing to kind of match the livery of the car where it it, some folks like the look some folks say it now it looks like it has a roof on it Uh, but either way the the test again was positive Uh, they said the the, the vision was great new garden said it felt a little foreign but after 20 30 laps uh, it was just fine Uh, both had high marks for the uh the, the new air inlet system to, to make sure that the guys are comfortable within there and not, not feeling claustrophobic and, and sweat. So um, this thing is set to debut in um, St. Petersburg. Uh, there's one more test coming up. Uh, it'll be James Hinchcliffe and Sebastian Bourdais testing it. Bourdais was selected to test this because he's one of the few drivers that wears eyeglasses. That's you know one of the one things they really haven't totally explored here. How a guy with he's got eyeglasses, a visor, and a windscreen, how his vision is going to be. So uh, we'll see if uh, Bourdais gives it high marks as well. But uh, it looks it looks like we're going to see this thing on the cars next year, um, and there's no stopping it, despite the despite the the backlash from the old school IndyCar fan base who thinks open wheel needs to be open cockpit and otherwise we're doing it looks like an IMSA DPI and speaking of IMSA Juan Montoya won the IMSA championship this past weekend now Seth our, our friend Louise wrote an article about uh, Montoya being the um, what do you call the un- underappreciated champion yes Something like that, yeah. But I, it's just another, it's another feather in the cap for Juan. I, I've known Juan for a long time. I think he's a good guy. And I think he's really one of the the finest he, talents of this generation. He, if I remember correctly, he's one of only two drivers to win a at Monaco and b twice the Indy 500. Uh, I mean, the accolades for him, you know, two NASCAR wins. Uh, uh, the list goes on and on for Juan. Uh, it's almost hard to fathom sometimes, at least as someone with a NASCAR background uh, like myself, only because, unfortunately, in the NASCAR world, he's more well known for the jet dryer incident than anything else, which I still put the full blame on him because he knew he was driving a uh car with a damaged piece but the team kept insisting that it was fine so it's one of those where i can't put the entire blame on him but as i was saying he has just accomplished so much in motorsports in so many different disciplines in different disciplines yeah that's Uh, the thing yeah i'd almost argue to say that he like tony stewart is our generation's AJ Foyt, Mario Andretti, only because of how much they've been able to accomplish in so many different disciplines. That being said, whether or not his career actually stacks up to an Andretti or a Foyt, maybe that's up for uh, debate. But you can't deny how much he's accomplished. Yeah, he also can't deny he's one hell of a tennis player as well. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, part of the part of the thing that maybe have tarnished him, I think he spent too many years in NASCAR and with only two wins to show for it. Um, obviously, he was a standout in cart, and when he returned to the IndyCar series so many years later, he was a standout again. Uh, Formula One, his uh, he had some ups and downs, just depending on the team he well, was with. But I think I think Juan's next move needs to to, to get in a good car for Le Mans and beat uh, you know beat Alonso to that uh, triple crown thing. Well, just uh, my two cents on uh, the his too many years in NASCAR. Uh, your observation there. A great driver cannot do anything in poor equipment. And what I mean by that is uh, Chip Ganassi Racing at that time, which then became Earnhardt Ganassi Racing, and then went back to Chip Ganassi Racing, they were in a massive, massive slump. They were with Dodge uh, in essentially a lame duck year, then went to Chevrolet uh, with DEI, which DEI was a shadow of its former self. And it was just a very lackluster team at that time. It did not start turning around until essentially Kyle Larson joined the team replacing Wong. Granted, McMurray did win the Daytona 500, did win at Talladega, did win the Brickyard 400. But other than those wins, he went winless for about another three years, got one more win, and then went winless the rest of his career. Now, Seth, I hate to tell you this, but we're out of time. <laughs> so let's let's all quickly make a pick for Kansas. And, Gray, I'll start with you. Oh, let's see here. Kansas, Kansas, Kansas. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, – uh, Chase Elliott, he needs to uh, needs to needs to do it, and I think he'll rise to the occasion. All right, now Richard. Seeing as you were so you bad mouthed him so much, uh, Kyle Busch. <laughs> okay, yeah, I didn't really bad mouth him, but well, you know. Seth did a little bit. Now Seth, since you were bad mouthed <laughs> Kyle Busch, <laughs> who, 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 who do you like? Um, God. Let's go with Alex Bowman. Okay, so that's going to leave me. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Martin Truex. I mean, that that guy has always been good on these type tracks. So uh, with that being said, uh, Kansas coming up. Formula One has a week off. And then we'll be in Mexico. We'll be back on this hemisphere. Uh, only a few weeks before we see Formula One in the States again. Uh But until then, I mean, I want to thank you, Gray, Seth, Richard. I want to thank the Hoobazoo Radio Network. I want to thank iHeartRadio, Spreaker, and uh, Google Podcast and YouTube Podcast who are hosting us now, which is awesome. And I want to thank all you folks who listen to us. Uh, Until next week, good night. W-H-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-B-A-